Chapter 5 They arrived in Chordak around noon. They were exhausted from the walk, though this was the normal state of everyone coming into the city, so they did not seem out of place. Kostem was careful not to speak and carry herself exactly the way Gogox was. This seemed to prove effective as no one paid much attention to them as she looked for the hotel manager. It took her a while to find the address because they were labeled very differently than in Salhain, despite the similar shapes. In Salhain, the addresses were logical. Every ring was numbered, and then the buildings on the inside were numbered in the order starting with the north end of the palace going clockwise. There were gaps left in for future buildings, but it was clear where everything should be. In Chordek, on the other hand, it was not nearly as clear. The numbering system seemed to make no sense at all. There were some buildings next to each other that had numbers that shot up a lot. Some tried to remedy that by applying subnumbers to newer buildings, while others just took the next free number. Of course, some buildings were brought down, so some took old addresses, but in place of one building there were two, so one of the two had an address that did not match. Luckily, however, Chordek was not a particularly large city, so she found the location soon enough. When she stepped through the door, however, it seemed as though her apparent invisibility disappeared. Everyone in the room stared, many with scowls on their faces, and at least one woman with her mouth hanging open. Gogok spoke up. I believe these are the offices for some hotels. A woman snapped her head toward him. Belly hook, she said curtly. May I ask why you're being so rude to us? Gogok said, his face tightening. Despite our name, we don't want Omtrexite from Belly in our offices. If you want to stay in one of our hotels, please go to the actual hotel. Gogox relaxed. That meant that they were upset about something other than Kagos. Kostem was safe for the moment. We're not customers, actually. We have business with your owner. Not likely. Gogox laughed. Isn't your boss doing redecorating? I believe my friend here is going to be setting up a delivery or two. I haven't heard anything about a delivery. I'm sorry, but my boss is very busy. Gogox looked back at Kostem. Do you remember the man's name? I wrote it down, she said. Head snapped back to her. Let me see what you wrote, Gogok said, and stepped beside her. Kostem nodded. What is wrong with me? I spent all that time not talking so I wouldn't give myself away and I'd just throw it away to answer a question I could have answered without speaking? She searched her notes and found the name. Dintar Gever. It's a Mr. Dintaro Gever, Gogok said. I'm well aware who my boss is, Kostem whispered to Gogox. He gave me this. She pulled out a coin. It was the Gavur crest. Gogox showed it to the woman. Oh, you got to be kidding me. He's ordering furniture from some Tad Omtrexite? What is wrong with him? Gogox struggled not to smile. Kostem had almost revealed herself, but no one even paid attention. They were more upset by Fads and Belie than they were by the possibility of someone from Salhain. Or, at least, they did not notice her accent. I'll call him up for you. Just wait there. Kostum and Gagax waited patiently, or more so than the other people in the lobby. The workers in the lobby were all restless, making consistent glances at Kostum. Kostum leaned to Gagax and said, Amazing idea. Sure does help me blend in. At least they don't think you're from Salhain or someplace ridiculous like that, he whispered back. Kostem smirked. Gagak spoke again, trying to diffuse the tension. So, does the king ever come here? The king has places to stay all over the country. Why would he come to the offices for a chain hotel? Hmm, right, of course, how gend of me. Do not mock us, the woman said forcefully. Gagak shook his head. They sat in silence for another few minutes before they heard a chime, and a man's voice came over an intercom. Who's here to see me? Just some gend omtrexite, saying they're selling you some furniture. How many times do we have to go over this, Gigato? You can't make personal judgments against my business partners. Send them up. You can go up, once we search for weapons and things, she said. Do what now? Gargok said. Kostum held her mouth shut. You can't go up unless we search you. Mr. Gaver is quite successful, and he has enemies because of it. She patted Gagax Kostem from head to toe. She also got a little too intimate with both of them, and pulled things out of their luggage, including Kostem's identification. Kagos dialect and Chordak dialect used the same written language, but there were very small things that stood out, not the least of which being Kostem's address written plainly on the ID. Amazingly, she did not check the actual card. What is this? She said, pulling out swatches. 
Those are obviously fabric swatches. We couldn't bring entire pieces of furniture with us for a preparatory trip, could we? Kagak said. Do you do this to everyone your boss works with? Seems like you do from that conversation. He's too free with his partnerships. You supply goods to him, that's it. You should be accompanied by security. He met me pretty easily without security in Pentak, Kostum said. Gigato narrowed her eyes. That's not an Eric's accent. Just then the door opened behind Gigato. What the hell are you doing? What did I just say? Gigato, if your mother didn't blackmail me into keeping you here, you'd be on your ass in under five seconds. Welcome, Kostum. And what the hell did you do to your hair? It's a long story, she said. They walked in the door and shut it behind them, but not before giving a glance to Gigato, who looked about to explode. I am so sorry. That's my niece. She can be rather protective of my inheritance. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, of course, mean of me. Your niece is going to inherit from you? Are you doing yay to with her? Kostum said. I may not have a choice. Infertile. I've got some kind of disease. Gotta live with it, I suppose. She's the closest family I have. I mean, other than my sister, of course, but I can't pass anything on to my older sister, can I? Well, things are a bit different in Salhain. If there's no heir, the inheritance just goes to the city. There's a lot of good stuff that came from people who didn't have heirs, to be honest. Well, that's even sadder than this, I think. Imagine not being able to control who you pass the line on to or not being able to do it at all just because you're infertile. It's not like the person's at fault for that. Well, all this means a lot, I'm sure. We're here for a reason. We need to set up delivery, and I believe you have those fabric swatches for a reason, right? Gagak said. Right. We need to discuss detailing. We can do simple patterns very quickly, but you get much more elaborate designs custom fit to the furniture for a little more money and time. Do you have any photographs? Better. I brought an example of one of the more elaborate pieces with me, along with simple swatches of basic patterns. Well, then let's see it. The elaborate pattern? Right. Uh, here it is. Kostum pulled a 116 model sofa out of her bag. It was a very peculiar design, but familiar. This is fascinating. You could probably make decent money just making miniatures, too. We actually do a lot of that, believe it or not. High-end doll furniture and pet furniture is a decent portion of our work. Rich people need something to do with all that money, right? May as well pull me up. Hmm, this looks familiar. It's based on the bed, but altered to suggest things worked out in the end. One of our more abstract pieces, but it's fully functional. Did you know the bed was here in Chordek? I'd heard. Some hermit lady has it, right? Yeah, rumors about her are pretty unbelievable. Like that she's 130 years old. Ha <laughs> ha. Chordakite are paranoid and superstitious. It can be frustrating, but it's not as bad as all that. As for the hermit lady, she isolates herself from the rest of the city, but she definitely has friends in high places. Do you have any other custom pieces you could show me? Obviously, I could only bring one, so I don't have other things to show you, but this is an example of our work. Something seemed to occur to Dintar. You're pregnant, aren't you? Congratulations. Kostem froze. She had been so busy concealing her national origins, she forgot about the baby. I... why are you... It's fine. I'm sure you'll make good on my order. Though you did say the more detailed work would take more time and money. Do you think, perhaps, that this was a poor time to advertise that particular option? He said and smiled faintly. I can do it, she said rather forcefully. I'm sure you can. That's when something occurred to Gagax. You're not from Chordek, are you? Oh, definitely not. I'm originally from Elam. I came here to work with my sister after some family troubles a while back. Moved my offices here when I realized I was going to have to pass my line on to my niece. I was living with family then, too, but I had a disagreement with my older brother. Doesn't matter much now, though. He's dead. My sister and niece are all I have left. Uh, I'm so sorry. I recently lost someone close to me, too. And my parents have been dead for years. Dintar got misty eyes, but said, No time to dwell on that now. We have business to attend to. Kostem showed him drawings, several more swatches, and wrote up a pricing list based on time, distance, difficulty of entry, and a few other issues, and waited for him to respond. He looked over the prices and smiled. This will do nicely. I don't think we need any custom jobs, but if we had a proper replica of the bed, it could do really well in Chordek. 
Not your more artistic take on it, but the real thing. My workers might have a slight issue with that. That history stings people in Kagos more than it does the people in Gregora. If not, then that's fine. How about this? Work it out with your workers, and if they're not offended by the idea, I'll pay extra. If not, I'll take a design like your artistic one. Kostim smiled and nodded. If you don't mind my asking, Dean Todd began, then took a deep breath. Are, uh, you and Gagox an item? No, she said quickly. That's unfortunate. I would have hoped you had found someone friendly to help you raise the child. Kostem shrank a little and said, I thank you for your concern, but I'm not entirely sure this is any of your business. I'm so sorry. I just have a soft spot for those who have lost people close to them, I guess. Especially the father of your child. Kostem froze. Gagax looked at the two of them, then his mouth hung open. He advanced on Dintar and said, I think it's time we wrapped up this meeting. She will have the beds and sofas on time if you have someone to help us bring it in. We'll need vehicles. The boys from the school won't cut it this time. Dean Todd closed his eyes and took a deep breath. His head drooped, and he said, Yes, fine. Uh, thank you. I'll see you when you deliver the furniture. That's 62 days for standard and 84 for custom, right? Let's go, Kostem, Gagak said and put his hand on her shoulder. She pushed it off. What do you know, she said. You said you were from Alam. Yes, I am. What do you know? I heard about your boyfriend, that's all. How could you even know it was her? Gagak said. Is that why you tracked me down? Because you felt sorry for me? I, I really would like new furniture for my hotels. It would improve our reputation, I think. It might. I don't want to be your charity case, Mr. Gever. It's not like that. I don't reject work for any reason for my workers' sakes. But if you did this because you feel sorry for me, we have nothing more to talk about. I will do the work for you like you asked, and you can feel like you did your good deed, but I'm only doing this for my workers. Sixty-two days. Please, please don't, Teen Todd began, but Kostum put her finger up. I have been treated like trash since we got here, but I'd rather have that than being treated like a child that needs to be protected. I get enough of that from Gagax and Aristin, even from my workers to some extent, though they at least depend on me. Goodbye, Mr. Gever. Kostem and Gagax walked out the door. Kostem touched her index and pinky fingers together and pushed her hand back towards Gagato as she walked out, a rude gesture among all Vinkins that essentially meant she could beat her in a fight. Gagato screeched as Kostem walked out. Gagax said, Kostem, I don't think it's a good idea to make enemies. She was already my enemy from the moment I stepped in the room. Yes, but don't make things worse. This isn't like you, Gagax pleaded. It's perfectly like me. It's just a me that doesn't normally come out to play, that's all. Well, don't do that to one of the guards or the military at the depot or anything. Kostem spun around and put her finger in Gagax's face. Since when are you such a coward? Coward nothing. Being tough is one thing. Being stupid is another entirely, and I've never been stupid. Confident when it's not earned, occasionally yes, but never stupid, he said, not blinking or flinching. Kostem growled. Things are getting nasty here. We can't rile people up. You can't afford it. I'm tired of people treating me like a child. I've run my own business and lived on my own since before I was of age for crying out loud. Deal with it. It's human nature. In Vinken, Tikiratin. People just want to help people who are hurting. That sure doesn't apply to any other situation. Or with other people. It's not charity anyhow, right? He gave you a job. That's not charity, by definition. It is if he only did it because I'm hard up. Well, maybe, but what about workers? I hired them because they're good at what they do. The fact that they're all hard up is irrelevant. You and I both know that's not true. Listen, it creeped me out that the guy knew about you already, but you know what? Provided that's all it is, he's giving you a contract because he knows you need help, he didn't do anything you wouldn't have done. Just, you know, don't see him without me there. Kostem twisted her mouth and side-glanced at Gagax. I won't. You won't have to worry. That's my girl. Where? I don't see her. Is it that old woman with the kale sore there? Kostem said, shielding her eyes from the light and squinting. You know what I mean, old woman. I could get a young woman if I wanted. Not with skin or a voice or personality like that. Thanks a lot. 
I'm just saving you from a lot of heartache, Kostum said, then smiled. Keep your advice, he said. Kostum sighed, then walked silently with Gagax for a few minutes as they wandered the town. You realize we're not done in there, right? Yeah, this is your business deal, not mine. You're my main transport from Pentak to Chordek. What about your medical friends from Montroncos? Gagax said. So, I have to get to Pentak anyhow, and time it with the return medical trips. Sounds like a lot of extra work. So I'm here to lighten the load? Of course. It's called risk assessment, Coast Gem. I gotta see if you'll be worth the trouble. As long as you're making new enemies here, you become less and less worth it. I'll be good. You better. They walked back into the office and Gagak shouted out, Mr. Gever! Gagato looked about to explode. You can't just barge in here like you own the place. There's a protocol to follow you again, bastard. Keepox, noisy star. I'm sure your mother will clean it up for you and give you a clean diaper, Gagak said. It's not noisy star, it's turning star. Yours is noisy sail, though. It is, and I'm making one right now. We're getting a nice big custom furniture order based on the bed from your uncle and securing the help of your workforce and whatever free vehicles we can get in delivery. Why are you helping that violent, disgusting Kegosite? Gagato said. No one's getting violent unless you try to stand in our way or your uncle's again. Or that be too hard for your tiny little brain to understand, you again, bastard. Dean Tata walked through the door again and said, What is going on? Sorry, sir. We just never discussed delivery. And I believe we should pursue those custom orders more aggressively, Kostum said. I want the enemy spies out of my shop. Oh, shut up, Gagato. You don't own this place yet. Stop acting like you do. I'll get my whole local staff to help with the delivery, and we can secure a couple of small trucks. We could do two full shipments in about four trips. That would take almost no time. You're not getting me to carry beds and sofas. If you want your job, you will. I don't want to pass anything to you right now. I'll pass it to a person on the street before I pass it to you. You are a spoiled, manipulative, terrible human being. And if your cousin hadn't died, I wouldn't have even felt the need to talk to you once the rest of your life. So stop being all those things, or I don't care if I have no one to do Yetu to. What is wrong with all of you? Did you hit your heads when you were having your little orgy in your office? See, this is why I hired you, Gagato. Your charm. Let's sign, Kostjem, and I would love to accompany the two of you back to Salhain. Salhain? The capital of Kagos? Um, I don't go to Salhain. I would love it if you accompanied me. Now, Kostjem, wait a moment. There's no way in hell you're going to Salhain if I have anything to say about it. Then keep your mouth shut for once, noisy star, Dintar said. I'm going to tell Mom. Goodbye. This is a companion story to Diamond Spearhead, available on Amazon now. As strange as it feels to say this, like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Especially share. That's more important than the other two.